Hello, this is Matt from Matt Heaney Apps. In this video, we will take a look at generics in Swift. So here I have a brand new playground in Xcode 12.4, all set up and ready to go. So boot up a new playground and let's get to work. So like I said, in this video, we will take a look at generics. Now, before we jump into it, Generics are a fairly advanced area of coding, so be prepared that it might take a few attempts to fully get your head around what generics are, how we use them, and why we need to use them. Generics can be used in incredibly advanced ways, but in this video, we start at the very beginning, we look at a number of different examples, and we'll work our way up to fully understand this area. Generics are such a powerful tool in coding, and they can make your code super flexible and super reusable, which is always a great thing. With generics, we can set up functions or objects, such as classes and structs, in a certain way, so they can work with a number of different types, all depending on when and how we use these functions and objects. Rather than tying these functions and objects to particular types, we allow these to work with a whole bunch of different types, and therefore making the logic as generic as possible. Now don't worry, that will probably make a lot more sense when we look at some code. So let's take a look. Let's start with a super simple example. Let's pretend we're making a really simple app where the user can provide two different options and the app will pick one of these options at random. It's essentially flipping a coin to pick either option one or option two. So let's begin by setting this up without generics. So. So let's make a brand new function. And with this function, what we're gonna do, we're gonna pass it two different integers. And it will just pick one of these integers at random and pass it back. So let's call this pick one int. When we call this, we're gonna pass it two different integers called option one and option two. And it will return another integer. So for this logic, the first thing that we have to do is pick a random number either zero or one. We will then simply say, if our random number generator gives us zero, return option one. If it returns one, return option two. So let random number, this is gonna equal an integer, and we can call the random method on int, and we can pass in a range of zero to one inclusive. Pick us a number between zero and one, including zero and one. So it will be set to zero or one. Then what we can pretty much do is say if random number equals zero, return option one, otherwise return option two. Nice and simple. Random number will be set to either zero or one, picked at random. If it's zero, return one of the options. If it's not zero, return the other option. Now you might choose to keep your code like this, but we can actually condense this down to one line, which I'm gonna do today. So rather than doing this, what we can do, we can do is a win line. So we can return, pretty much say, if random number is zero, if that's true, return option one, otherwise return option two. A little bit cleaner, a little bit more concise. Same thing as our big if else statement. And that's it really. From here, we can call this function and pass in two integers and it'll pick one at random. Right, nice and simple. So we're gonna let, let's call it my int, nice and descriptive, I guess. And we're gonna call pick one int, and we're gonna pass in 23 and 72. Now my int will either be set to 23 or 72. And you know what, let's print this just to make 100% sure. Let's hit run. And as you can see, it's set to 72. If you was to run it a couple of times, sooner or later, it would be the other option. So we now have our logic all set up for our function. Assuming, of course, that we want to pick one of two options when they're integers. But that isn't always going to be the case. So say, for example, we base our app around this, and it's a bit of an outside shot, but it's a huge success on the App Store. And we suddenly decide that, you know what, maybe we should give the user an option to pass in two doubles, so numbers with decimal points, and it will return one of those at random as well. So we might look at this function and say, hmm, okay, we can't really use this because it has to pass in integers. Right, if we was to try passing the double, so 23.5, for example, our code will kick off and say, that's not an integer, you can't do it. 
So what we might end up doing is grabbing this entire function, we're gonna copy it, we're gonna paste it, we're gonna rename it to pick one double, and now option one will be of type double, option two will be of type double, and we're gonna return of type double. That's it, everything else will stay the same. Random number is still gonna be an integer, still be zero or one, and we're still gonna return either option one or option two, depending on the outcome of our random number generator. Just this time, they happen to be doubles. Option one is a double, option two is a double, so therefore, we're gonna return a double. Sweet, we can now use it, right? So my double, this time we're gonna run pick one double, and we can pass in 16.5, for example, and 90.7 for example. Now this already feels a bit wrong. This is the exact same function, just working with doubles rather than integers. And in this example, it's already very, very basic logic, but this could be wildly complicated logic. And we're gonna have to copy that all across. And then suddenly, if we make a change in one place, we gotta change it in two places. That's asking for trouble. But even if that doesn't sound too bad, say for example, we want to pass in two strings then suddenly this becomes pick one string. Let's make all the changes. And then we have a third function, but say we want to do this with Boolean, say we want to do it with CG sizes, with labels, with view controllers, with images. There's so many options. We could end up with so many functions. That's a big issue, especially considering the logic is the exact same, apart from the type it's working with. This is exactly where generics come into play. So let's have a look at how we could do this. Our coin flip example, this time with generics. So with generics, what we could do, we could set up a similar function, but we can make this work for any type. It hasn't got to work with just integers or just doubles or just strings or just whatever. It can work with any type. And how this works is we don't specify what type we want to use when we set up our function. Instead, we tell Swift that we want to use generics. And rather than specifying that type now, we, in a way, specify the type when we call the function. Let's take a look. So one more function, this time just called pick one. In the name of this function, we haven't got to specify what type we're gonna work with because it's gonna work with any type. The problem is we know we need to pass in two options, right? Option one, option two. But we don't know what type they are. How do we tell Swift that we don't know what type it is, but we want it to work with a certain type at some point in time? Well, what we can do before we pass in some parameters, we can use these brackets and pass in a name here. The name we pass here will be used as a generic type for this function. This name here will almost work as a placeholder for the type that we want this function to use. Now you can call this anything really. You can call it my type, for example, or my generic type or generic or whatever you want. But convention is to use a T, T for type. What we can then do is pass in our parameters just like we would do normally, so option one. But this time, rather than saying it's gonna be an int or a string or a Boolean or whatever, this is gonna be of type T, this from here. So here, if you put my type or my generic or whatever you called it, this name has to match. This is this. We can then work our way through the rest of the function signature. Option two will also be of type T and we're gonna return type T, something of type T. We can then carry out our logic from above in the exact same way. But the beauty of this is we can now use this method on any type. So let's quickly recap this. We've now declared a brand new function which will use a generic type, which we have called T. T could be any type. It could be an integer, it could be a string, it could be a billion, it could be absolutely anything. At this point, we don't know what it is. But what we do know is that this function has to take option one of this type, option two of this type, and it must return something of the same type. So we're not specifying the type to use here, but we're still specifying the rules of the function. For example, option two has to be the same type as option one still. They both have to be of type T. And we have to return 
the same type as option one and option two. This is still a type and the T here will be the same as the T here, which will be the same as the T here. It's the rules, we just don't know what T is yet. So when do we find out what T is? Well, not when we create the function, instead, when we call the function, we'll be able to figure out what T is. So after this, let's make a brand new constant, which we could call selected in, for example. This is gonna equal pick one. Now not pick one int, not pick one double, not pick one string, instead our generic function. Very important you get the right one. Now what you can see here, it's not asking us for an integer, it's asking us for type t. But we can put an integer in here, and we can put one here. And that's enough for our compiler to figure out what t is. So let's pretend we're the compiler. We're gonna look at this and say, okay, I need to run pick one. I need to work with this generic type, which is T, but I don't know what it is yet. I have this information, which is option one and option two, but that's all I really have to work with. Option one is an integer. That must mean T is an integer. Great. Option two therefore must be an integer. Therefore I must return an integer. The compiler can figure out what T means when we call it and depending on the way that we call it. Same thing if we did a string. This time we could pass in two strings. Our compiler will say, okay, T must be a string because option one's a string, option two's a string, therefore T's a string, so I have to return a string. It can figure out what this is based on the context and based on how we're using it and then figure out how the rest of the function should work. Even though we don't specify what T is, we still have to play by the rules. So for example, if we was to do one more, I'm running out of names for these, let's call it A, and we're gonna call pick one, and we passed in a 12, which is an integer, and we passed in a string. The compiler will kick off. We can't do this because it breaks the rules. It will look at this and say, option one is an integer, therefore T must be an integer. Then it will look at this and go, whoa, hang about, that's a string, but if T's an int, this has to be an int. And that's true. We have to be consistent with T, whatever T is. And if you look at the error here, we're being told exactly that. Cannot convert value of type string to expected type int. The compiler has figured out that T is an integer, but option two of type T isn't an integer. It's not happy with us. So just like that, we can use generics to specify how a function should work without specifying the types to give us that flexibility to make this function incredibly reusable. But this function doesn't have to stop there. We can, if we wanted to, have multiple generic types in this function. For example, we could have T and U. And we could say option one is of type T, option two is of type U, and we're gonna return whatever type T is. So as long as we return the same type as option one, the compiler will be happy. Now we're not doing that here, <laughs> but I wanted to show you that. We haven't got to limit ourselves to just one generic type in a function. So that is the root of what generics are. Here we're not specifying what types this function will use. Instead, this is being figured out when we call this function. We specify the rules when we set up the logic. And as long as we play by those rules, we can use this function in any way that we want and with any type that we want. How powerful is that? Okay, so this is great. But sometimes when you want to work with generics, just saying, hey, here's a block of code, go work with any type, isn't quite specific enough. You want to have a generic function, but you might need to have some control over the types that this function can use. Well, we can achieve this with type constraints. Let's have a look at when this might be a factor. So let's add a brand new function. This one will be called add numbers together. And it will take two parameters. These must both be numbers and we will add them together. Now, just like above, we could go through and set one of these up for an integer, one for a float, one for a double and so on. But we don't really want to do that. So let's make this generic, right? Be of type T. And we call our parameters value one of type T and value two of type T. And this will return 
of type T. Just as a quick side note, the names that we give our generic types are scoped to the function. So we can call this type T and it will not get mixed up with the T from the generic function above. I was going to return value one plus value two. Now that looks great, right? We're going to take a look at this and say, perfect. We can pass in anything into this function as long as value one is the same type as value two, both of type T, and it must return the same type. Now, in the case of numbers, that's fine. So for example, an integer would work fine here. A double would work fine. A float would work fine. But not all the types would work fine here. What would happen if we tried to add two booleans together, for example? If you add true and false together, what do you get? Or think even more extreme. Say you're making a social media app and you try to add two users together and get one user back. What on earth is gonna happen there? I mean, you could set up some rules to make that happen, but most of the time that isn't really what you want to happen in your code. In fact, our compiler won't even let us build a function like this because not all types can be added together. In fact, certain types have to conform to a certain protocol to be able to be added together. So as you can see from this error, we can't actually even run this because not all types can even do this logic because they can't be added together. So we don't want to just say, okay, let T be any type in this function. We want to say it can be any type as long as it's a number. And with type constraints, we can set this up to say only accept types that conform to a certain protocol or that inherits from a certain class. So what we can do, we can say B of type T as long as T conforms to the numeric protocol, which the number types in Swift do. So int does, for example. A string is not a number, so it doesn't. Now this works and it's generic, but it's constrained enough to make sure we get what we actually want to happen. So now we can work with any type and T can be any type as long as it conforms to this protocol and therefore in this case, as long as it's a number. So now we can run our add numbers together function. And you can see it's not actually of type T, it's of type numeric. Our function will work with it as type T, but when we call the function, because it has to be numeric, it's telling us, make this type something that is numeric. So 12 and 48, for example. The compiler likes this and it will work. And it will return this number, which you know we, we could set to something if we really wanted to. If we was to do this with strings, the compiler is gonna kick off. And as you can see, string does not conform to numeric. It's not a number, so we can't use it here. So now T can be anything as long as it's a number. Generic, but with some control. Now, despite this constraint, we still have to play by the rules of the function. Type T has to be consistent. We still can't use an int and a double, for example, even though both are numeric. T can still only be one type. So let's see that in action. We have 12 and let's go for 48.7. Both are numeric, right? But we still have to play by the rules. And in this case, the compiler is actually smart enough to convert this 12 to a double, which will not show the point I'm trying to make. If we lock that in to be an integer, now it's gonna kick off on us. And as you can see, we're getting an error that says, hey, one of these is a double, hey, one's an int. You can only use one type because even though it's generic, we're only working with type T. So that is generics with type constraints. And hopefully by now you're really starting to see the power of generics. But this is only using generics with functions. We can go even further with this and we can make generics work with brand new objects, such as classes and structs. So let's see that in action. Okay, so generic objects, how do they work and why would we use them? Well, let's have a brand new example and let's work our way through it one step at a time. So for this new example in this video, we're gonna go back to one of my favorite examples currently in these code videos and let's pretend we're building a shopping app. 
So in this example, the bit of the app that we care about is the top 10 charts for a particular category of item. So a user can come into the store and they can see the top 10 video games that are currently being sold, or the top 10 films, or the top 10 books, or the top 10 whatever. We wanna make an object for these top 10 charts where we can do some things like we can store the list of items, we can easily get the number one item from that list, and we can shuffle that list in case we have a user who wants to mix this list up to help them find something new. So let's set this up for our first category. So for this first category, we're gonna make a top 10 charts of video games. So for this, we would need a brand new class, so a brand new kind of object for a video game. Now, normally this would have properties for, you know, a name, a genre, an age rate, and a price, the developer, and, and so on. But for today, it's not gonna have anything. It will just act as an object in place. So we have this new class, video game. We can now use this in our first top 10 charts object. So, brand new class called top 10 charts. And this will be all of the logic for the charts around the top 10 video games currently in our store. In here, we would have an array for the actual charts themselves, and this will just be an array of video games. And to start with, we're gonna give this a value here rather than passing something in through an initializer. And for this example, we're just gonna set it to an empty array. Now in a real life app, this would obviously be a list of the video games in the charts. Let's keep it simple for the example, but just use your imagination of how this would work in an actual app. We'd also then have a function called get number one. This will return a video game and it will just return whatever is at index zero in our charts array. And again, I get this would make it crash because there's something in there, but use your imagination so we can focus on the topic. Finally, we want one function in here called get shuffled list which is going to return an array of video games and that will just return charts dot shuffled like so so we now have this class which is all the logic for our top 10 charts and this charts in particular is around video games when we just have this one category though when we just have video games that's fine it's going to work really well but the problem is we don't just sell video games in this store. We also sell books, and we also sell phones, and we also sell movies. And we want a top 10 charts for each of these. So we could take this logic and convert it into a top 10 charts video game, and then we have another one of these for books, another one for phones, another one for movies, and so on and so on. The problem is, what happens if we end up with a thousand categories? What if we end up like Amazon and there's just an endless amount of items? We just can't maintain that system. We need to find a way to make this one version work with any different type that we care about. I'm actually gonna bump up all of these other classes now that we have more of our example in place, just to keep it a little bit tidy. So we want this class to be generic. And we want to have a top 10 charts of anything, of any type that we care about. And that, you might be thinking, is the perfect use for generics. Well, it is. So what we can do is say, when we create a new top 10 charts class, we're gonna use a generic type. And we tell the class about this generic type on the class declaration, and we specify the name of a generic type. Again, it could be T, it could be U, it could be item, it could be anything. Again, convention is to use T, but sometimes it does make more sense to give us a name. But I personally like to keep it as a letter, so let's work with T. So now, rather than charts being an array of video games, it will be an array of type T. Rather than our get number one function returning a video game, it's gonna return of type T, and then get shuffled list will return an array of type T. So whatever T is in this class, it will be used in all these places. If T is video game, then charts will be an array of video games. This will return a single video game, and this will return a shuffled list of video games. But if T is a book, so this from here, 
Let's make these a single version. If T is a book, then the charts will be an array of books. It will return a single book, and this will be a shuffled array of books. If T was a phone, then charts would be an array of phones, and so on. How can we then move on to use this? Well, when we make a brand new instance of this, so we could call this a video game charts, this is gonna equal a brand new top 10 charts. And then what we can do in the exact same way as from here, we can have these brackets and we can pass in what type we want to work with. What should the type of T be set to? Well, in this case, video game. This is gonna be the top 10 charts of video games. Then we initialize it just like we would do with a normal class. Now, video, oops, video game charts. If we was to get the charts property, as you can see, it's an array of video game. If we get number one on the charts, it will return a video game. Shuffled list will return an array of video game. But if we wanted one of these for our books, then we can do that. We can specify top 10 charts, but this time we want this charts to be for books. So book charts dot charts, as you can see, an array of book items. Get number one, we'll return a book. Get shuffled list, we'll return an array of books. We are specifying what type we want this object to work with. We are specifying what T is, and then it is working with T. You could use type constraints here as well. So we could specify that T has to conform to a certain protocol, or it inherits from a certain class. But by including this, we have made our first generic class. Generic objects are actually fairly common in Swift, so you may have been working with generic objects without even realizing it. For example, arrays and dictionaries are both generic objects, but this is how it looks when we put our own generic object together. And the big thing that you might be thinking is that we have to specify what type this is, but we don't always have to do that. So I'm gonna comment out these examples just so we can keep them there for reference. But let's change our class a little bit so we haven't got to specify what T is. And the problem is we have to specify T because our class has no way to figure out what T is, right? If we was to just say this without specifying the type here, our compiler will complain and say it has no idea what T is, as you can see from this error. It can't be inferred but sometimes it can infer what T is. It can figure out what T is without us telling it. This can happen when we have an initializer. So if we didn't just start with an empty array for charts, for example, say we got rid of that and we set up an initializer where we have to pass in something of type an array of T and we're gonna set that to charts like this. Now, when we set up a brand new top 10 charts, we have to pass in some information, right? We have to pass in the top 10 charts. So now let's set up a new top 10 charts for video games. As we now have to pass something in, let's declare a brand new video game. I mean, use your favorite video game. I'm gonna use Uncharted, and this will be of type video game, like so. Now, when we do video game charts, which be a top 10 chart, we're gonna pass in an array of video games. And that's gonna be enough for the compiler to figure out what type T is. Because it will look at our initializer and say, okay, what are you passing in? It's gonna figure out we're passing in an array of type video game. And it's gonna say, oh nice, T must therefore be a video game. And it will figure itself out for us from there. So now if we was to grab something from the video game charts, such as the charts themselves, it'd be an array of video games. Get number one will return a single video game and get shuffled list will return an array of video games. However, if we was to do something similar with a book, my book is gonna be called Intro to Swift and it will equal a book. Now, if we make a brand new charts, but passing in an array of books, this time, the compiler can figure out the T is gonna be set to books, and therefore, when we get the charts on book charts, it'd be an array of books, get number one will return a book, and get shuffled list 
will return an array of books. It's a generic object, but this time the compiler can figure out what type T is without us saying based on the information we're passing in through the initializer. And just like that, we now have this generic, incredibly reusable class. And to recap, we've done this by specifying type T as a generic type for this class, which is used throughout this class. Then when we set up this class, it can either be inferred by passing in something to work as type T, in this case through the initializer, because we're passing in an array of books in this case, the compiler will figure out that T must therefore be book, but if we pass in video games, then T must be video games. Or we can directly say what type to work with, just like we did here. And that is how we can use generics when it comes to objects. And that is the introduction to generics. So that wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed that video. I've always wanted to do a video on generics. So let me know what you thought. As always, post any questions or any comments down in the comment section. It's really quiet down there nowadays. Post something in there, even if you're just saying, hey. And thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, make sure to hit like, make sure to hit subscribe, and I will see you next time. Cheers again. Bye.